All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Sue Kelso. I'm with the Good Heart Artist Residency in Good Heart, Michigan. And I'm excited to share this conversation between two, between two writers today. Um, we have Andrew Hamilton. Can you say hello, Andrew? Hello. Hi, Andrew. Um, Andrew is a doctoral candidate in English at the University of um, Minnesota, and he lives in Minneapolis. And next we have our um, writer in residence who starts on this, well, this Friday, and she'll have a two week stay in Goodhart. It's Monica Rico. Hello, happy to be here, excited. <laughs> Good, thank you so much, Monica. Um, Monica is, uh, I'm gonna read the, her bio here. Um, She's a second generation Mexican American who grew up in Saginaw, Michigan, alongside General Motors and the legend of Theodore. Okay, help me on that last name. Thank you. Thank you. She is an MFA candidate at the University of Michigan's Helen Zell's Writers Program and works for the Bear Rivers Writers Conference. She is currently working on her first full length poetry collection, Pinion a magical realistic history of Mexican migration to Michigan and its impacts on the building of the General Motors empire. This collection focuses on family, family, well, family history, the roles of women and intergenerational trauma. All right, thank you so much, both of you for joining us. Uh, what I'd like to start with is Monica's gonna share some of her poetry. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Monica. Great, all right. Uh, the first poem I'm gonna read is a poem about Saginaw and it's called Poem in Consideration of My Death, After Vallejo. I will die on Sunday afternoon in Saginaw, following a plate of my mother's enchiladas, fried chicken and rice. I will scrape up the congealed queso fresco and sauce with a tortilla chip, with my index finger among the garnish of iceberg lettuce and chopped tomato, full I pour a cup of coffee. My father is there in his 1986 blue Buick Regal. If there is a heaven, this is it. The car lot on State Street, my father's smile as we discuss the different shades of red, candy, burgundy, cherry, and something that sparkles in between. I know I am dead as we drive to pick up tortillas the last stop every Sunday. The day will slice itself into a lemon, splay its fingers and clean the salt from its nails as we roll our tortillas on Grandma Rico's porch made of red tulips. We cannot eat in the car. The sun setting is a gold tooth beyond the abandoned parking lot covered in dandelions. The salt and sour of the lemon my final taste of this planet. My mother will gather her blue robe, line it with roses, cut like stars. So good. That, that was so awesome. Good. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and Monica, it's so great to meet you. Uh, this is the first time we've been able to see each other's faces, um, but it's been so fun kind of chatting back and forth via email and to be able to see you and to hear you read your work is such an honor. Um, and I do think that this is not only uh, beautiful and fantastic work, but really important work. Um, I think the way that you are thinking about place, uh, the way that you're thinking about language, the way that you're thinking about the body and, <clears throat> and food, um, but then also thinking about that in terms of what it means to put those experiences into poem, into form, um, to pull on images and history um, in this and put together this beautiful tapestry that I think really uh, invites us to rethink our relationship to place and, and what place even means. Um, so thank you for your work um, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about it. Um, I guess I just wanted to open up the conversation just thinking about poetry um, and poetry as a form, as a as a tradition uh, in many cultures um, and in multiple cultures together. And just to hear and learn more about like what, what brought you to poetry, uh, why poetry and kind of what books and poets and folks and experiences and collectives uh, inform your work and your practice as a poet. Yeah, cool. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think um, like 
most people who write, the thing that brings you to writing is reading and your love of reading. I remember uh, being small enough and not knowing how to read. And I remember holding the books and running my fingers over the letters and knowing that someday I'll know what that means. And just that idea of wanting to know what that means drove me <laughs> and still drives me into reading as much as I possibly can. And um, one day when I was at the library, I started reading Nikki Giovanni and uh, her poetry changed my life. Um, she was the first um, woman of color that I had ever read that was a poet. She was amazing. Uh, just everything about her, I found incredible. Her activism, her writing about food. I mean, her poem, My House, where she talks about the chicken that she makes. I mean, that poem always makes me salivate. Um, yeah, so that was her. And then I started reading uh, Sandra Cisneros and Ana Castillo. Um, they were huge influences for me. Uh, the work of Pablo Neruda, Federico Garcia Lorca, the surrealist king, and, um, you know, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I mean, those are my biggest influences for sure. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, a lot of the names that you're talking about, uh, Nikki Giovanni especially, and thinking about sort of the the legacy of the Black feminist movement, um, and that kind, and and then also Neruda and Lorca and Cisneros of the sort of like deeply felt um, connection. I don't even want to call it connection, but like that the the starting place for their work is this relationship between the personal and the political. Mm -hmm. um, do you, does that resonate with you? Is that something that you are aiming for in your work? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. How does it, how do you go about doing that? Or how are you thinking about that connection between the personal and the political? How is the personal political for you? Well, I think it's just for, for starters, for me, um, as a young person, when I decided I wanted to be a writer, which was when I was in middle school, um, I started looking for women writers. And when I was looking for women writers and I was looking for specifically women poets, I found just a very small handful of white women mm -hmm. and they were not speaking to any experience that I understood or could see as my own. And um, I found that really frustrating. It wasn't until I was in high school that we were, uh, it wasn't even my class, it was my friend's class was given a house on Mango Street to read. And she was just, uh, my best friend, uh, Laura, gave me the book and was just like, this reminded me of you, I thought you might like it. And I was just blown away. It was the first time I had ever seen my experience as a Mexican American represented in literature. And um, ever since then, I've been trying to chase it around and find it and look for it. And uh, I was thinking of what Toni Morrison said, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing of, you know, you write the book that you want to read. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started writing is I wanted to write about the experience of a Midwestern Mexican in Michigan, uh, growing up around basically like the decay of the General Motors empire. Yeah. Midwestern Mexican is a wonderful phrase, uh, which I think I wanna come back to uh, in a little bit, but do you wanna read another poem? Sure. Awesome. Uh, so this next poem I'm gonna read is, um, it's about the Mexico that my um, grandparents were leaving, which was directly after the revolution. And um, there was nothing there. There were no jobs, there was um, poverty. You. Uh, there was no point in staying. So everyone was leaving and there was a migration of specific work that people did to leave. And my, you know, I followed through my grandfather's path of what he did before he got to Michigan, but this is where he ended up. But this is the story of my great grandfather, the noiseless flight of owl wings. It wasn't a rumor, it was true. My great-grandfather flew beside Pancho Villa. There was no gold unless it was in the teeth. Is it possible for the airiness of dust to be a kind of common gold? Heavy on the eyelashes, 
wings, horse hooves, and the stretch of cracked leather. It is the part of the land no one lays claim to, a casualty of walking with the folded gold of a corn tortilla in one hand, while the other maps great-grandfather's noiseless flight. The thing Pancho Villa told his men to imitate at night and keep their gold teeth masked in the mouth. The only drop of light should come from the guns aimed at the sleeping soldiers. The bandoliers beaming, beaming bullets hung from the chest in salute and gold. My great grandfather was shot out of the sky, still alive. The Federales pulled out his feathers and kept him conscious for three days before they stopped the wind from his throat in the gold of midday, where sweat, blood, and the fluid that can no longer be called tears turn the dust into mud. His dead wings hidden with corn husks by my great grandmother, a golden eagle, before she disappeared and allowed the moon to reflect off her forehead in chorus. The talons of her husband, whose call and response had not been preserved in a ring of gold, she ascends to the heavens to braid the plumage of my great grandfather Jacinto into Horion's belt. When I look up, I say Rico and wait for her wings and his eyes to recognize me with a flash of gold. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, okay. So there's a lot going on in this poem, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and some of the things that really stand out to me, just this is like my fourth or fifth time hearing slash reading it. Um, and every time something else emerges for me, but there seems to be these tensions between history, um, histories um, and uh, migration um, movement in general, but then also birds. Um, and the the plumage, the uh, wings being hidden, the sort of very Marquesian um, old man with wings, right? Um, but I'm also just really interested in the in how you're thinking about mapping, right? Like the, the line of a casualty of walking with the folded gold of the corn tortilla in one hand, while the other hand, while the other maps great grandfather's noiseless flight uh, in a land and part of the land no one lays claim to. Um, and then even jumping down to the last stanza with Orion's belt, right? That there's sort of like a celestial mapping happening. So all of that is a very roundabout way to ask you uh, how you are thinking about uh, the relationship between language and place um, and poetic language and place and sort of um, a sort of maybe a two part and you can take this wherever you want to go. How do you see yourself constructing place or place, how our place is sort of constructed by language, but then also thinking about this place and kind of recalling um, the idea of the, the Midwestern Mexican um, and how I feel like your poems really trouble easy um, categories in terms of borders uh, and um, what constitutes a place um, when we think about race or we think about national identity. Um, so I, I'm really interested to hear more about how you feel like Poetry in particular language is interrupting and constructing place in this way. Yeah, so I think, you know, when you think about place, for me, I think about story, right? So how you become familiar with a place is by hearing the story of what the place was like before you were there and by hearing it from different people who all get to describe this particular place to you. Um, for me, obviously, um, I've only been to um, Mexico twice. And uh, all of, I've never been to the village my grandparents um, grew up in. So everything that I'm piecing together is just from stories that I've heard and things that I've read about that time period. And I kind of, you know, in some way to me, the idea of creating place is taking all of these various histories and narratives and weaving them together, right? To have a full picture of not just the 
physical landscape, but an emotional landscape for the people who live, who are from there. Mm -hmm. Do you mind talking about your relationship to like Saginaw a little bit more? Um, I mean, that, that in your bio, you talk about like GM and Rutke, right? Like is the sort of like the two poles, it sounds like for you. And um, Michigan in general and, and Saginaw in particular, just really interesting um, as historically in as places of industry and capital um, and deep exploitation and union and labor activism. Um, but then also Michigan and Saginaw in particular being Ojibwe places uh, and Ojibwe words, Michigan, I mean, this, we won't jump to it, but it made me think of another line that you were drawing between sort of indigenous words that get used by settlers to sort of like map out their own territory. Um, so as like given and in, in, in enveloping all of the the deep family history and national history, like how are you thinking about your own relationship to Saginaw and Michigan um, as places with all of these deep complex layered histories happening? Yeah, it's it's really hard to think about. Um, for me, I've had, you know, as I, when I grew, when I was growing up in Saginaw, I couldn't wait to leave, right? You know, everyone hates where they're from. It's the worst thing ever, um, you know, but the thing that saves it is there's Retki, right? Uh, this beautiful, gorgeous, you know, poems that are uh, steeped in uh, a certain history of uh, Saginaw, right? And a history that I have no experience with whatsoever, right? This like magical place of uh, the greenhouses where he's walking and he's touching the dirt and caressing all the flowers, right? Um, so there's that, that's, that's what was redeeming Saginaw for me for quite a while. Um, but I just kept coming back to the factories and I kept coming back to thinking about all of my friends and all of their fathers who worked at the factories and then their brothers who worked at the factories and then their father's fathers who worked at the factories. And it, it, it was so uncommon, right? And we all did that. We all, everybody's family worked at the factory. Everybody had a GM car. And I just, that, that kind of life, I didn't see other places. And so I was just kind of endlessly drawn back to it. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, my father was diagnosed with cancer and had to have surgery and was going through chemo. And I came home to talk with him and kind of try to lift his spirits and get his mind off of, you know, that. And uh, I started kind of seeing Saginaw in a different way at that point. Uh, and then my mother fell, she broke her ankle and I ended up staying there for over uh, two months just taking care of them. And I was for the first time back in Saginaw seeing it as an adult, not as a child. And just everything started to change. Um, there was so much destruction, half, over half of the things I grew up with are gone. There's nothing there. Um, the factories are gone. And what's there now are wildflowers. What's there now are deer. The cement has, has been broken by the earth and it's returned, right? And um, so I just tried thinking about that as there, what happens when industry leaves? What happens to a people? What happens to a city? And then what happens to the actual earth, right? Um, yeah, th those are just things I kind of think about a lot. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I think even like what gets characterized as decay, mm -hmm. um, it is decay of, of whatever, you know, the, uh, the fixed capital, as you might call it, uh, but the, the structures that are there to make the industry work. Um, but that is in deep relationship with the revitalization of what was built over, right? And like requires that decay, um, which is such an interesting relationship and tension to me. Um, have you read Adrienne Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy at all? No. You might be interested. She's, I have it right in front of me. She's. Um, she lives and works in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, a lot of like similar thinking about kind of the political potential of the natural world and, and fractals um, and dandelions and, and uh, mushrooms and how, how those things, the lessons that they have to teach us beyond um, about interdependency, but also about like what political movements could look like. Um, so that might be, might be something. Um, <laughs> speaking of mushrooms, one last thing I want to, and I know we're kind of getting a little long on time, but I'm just really fascinated by the way you write about food. Uh, food shows up constantly and, and in the most um, unexpected places. A poem about Odysseus, or uh, that starts about Odysseus, um, includes the line um, to, to a, a dear one, I haven't eaten all your ribs dipped in sauce and kept warm with a piece of white bread, which is so good. Um, and tortillas and enchiladas and all of the different kinds of food that pop up, but then also um, like I'm thinking specifically about an unusual bird divides the sky, which we will hear in a moment, but a line about sugar uh, from rotting fruit, pressing puffy, puffy taco dough into seams in the body. And it's, it feels like um, while at the same time that you're thinking about uh, history and um, larger patterns of migration and industry and capitalism, that you're also thinking very deeply about the body um, and that sort of sensory tactile experience. Um, and then also food as this, um, uh, I don't know, I would love to hear more about how you're thinking about food and the body in place and poetry. <laughs> yeah, for me, um, I feel that food is a way for people to communicate with each other, right? Um, I come from a pretty private family and uh, I feel that the best way that we've communicated with each other is by feeding one another, right? And um, that's where we get together and do things in, um, in a harmony, right? Um, for Mexicans, uh, often every Christmas they get together and they make tamales for the whole family. And this is like a process that takes days, right? And you know, you're uh, making 200 tamales and those are the gifts that you're giving everybody. It's a, it's a community it's the familial thing, you know, uh, I did it with my mother, you know, and our, my cousins would come, my grandmother would come and everyone worked on those things together. And there's just something really special and beautiful about that. Um, and it's interesting that you pick up the line about the, the burning smell of sugar. Um, so one of the major industries for uh, Mexicans migrating to Michigan was the sugar beet uh, factory, the sugar beet work, right? So um, specifically in the early part of um, the 20th century, uh, there were trains directly uh, leaving uh, San Antonio, Texas to take you to Saginaw, which was to work in Bay City for the sugar beet. Um, so every fall when you're in Saginaw or anywhere near Bay City, all you can smell is this intense, uh, sweet, just, uh, sickly, sick, <laughs> sticky yeah. smell. And those are the sugar beets. And that's the smell that many, many, many Mexicans who came to the Tri-City area, that was their work. That was their livelihood. And it's, it's just kind of impossible um, to not think about that industry when thinking about Saginaw. That's just, a, that's just a smell that's there. It's been there for a really long time, right? And it's there every single fall when the sugar beets are harvested. Yep, I spent a little time in Idaho um, and sugar beets are also a huge crop there. And I remember, especially in winter time, uh, for some reason, the smell felt like it carried so much more. And it was the, like, I'd never smelled, I grew up in Southern California. I never smelled anything like that before. Um, and it was like this peanut buttery sweetness almost. It's sure. really hard to describe if you've never smelled it, but yeah. Um, but it's interesting though, how you're thinking about, again, this relationship between capital and industry, uh, but then like how that manifests sensorially, that like that smell becomes part of that place um, and indicative of also um, folks making lives, right? And and that breakdown and even the way smells don't respect borders, right? <laughs> that they, yeah, uh, even as they're const constitutive of, of place. Um, I love that, it's such a beautiful, Beautiful image. Would you mind reading that poem to close us out? Yeah, no. Okay. 
So this poem is about uh, the time that I came to Saginaw to take care of both of my parents. And um, while I was there, uh, I wake up uh, early in the morning and write and read. And while I would wake up to drink my coffee and look out the window, there was an actual gray crow who was out there every morning. Um, and it was kind of <laughs> one of the most amazing things, right? Uh, just because a gray crow is so unusual. Um, he was beautiful. And this is, uh, this is this. An unusual bird divides the sky. I return unlike the gray crow who has been missing for months. I hope he has migrated to Mexico with the monarchs and robins, not transitioned to the holy blue spruce made of nebula and squirrel chatter. My mother tugs my shirt, snug, no comment. I leave my shoes behind like banana peels. I step into the kitchen because I can no longer smell the lilac bush my father cut down. My mother tries to say beautiful, but won't. She is busy trying to find her favorite pan. She knows she does not have enough rice to feed me. And what about her coffee pot? The one I've spent my whole life washing. I drink so much coffee it comes back to me, like the male house finch who lands in the cup of my ear, flaps his feathers, and hangs a mailbox from my earlobe. At least I am alive. At what height can I find the gray crow? The plum trees I drape my body from because they are easy to climb. Among the crab apple and pear trees, a carpet of rotten fruit no one tries to keep up with. Their sugar emerges from my body like pressing puffy taco dough into seams held together with a toothpick. They shimmer in fevered oil. I am told to look for atomic number 10, a rabbit, the word frijoles, I eat. My father removes his pistola from the ankle of his boot, a speck of sparkle that bends into a shock wave swallowing outer space. I know a gray crow when I see one. I return to the constellation named Saginaw. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for this conversation. It Thank really you. has truly been an honor. No, <laughs> it's an honor to get to talk to you. Um, I wish you all the best in your residency and hope that again, it's just a productive and generative time. Um, we need this work. It's important and beautiful work in um, thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you so much and good luck with finishing your dissertation and may it be brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you both of you. I just feel it's been a treat to witness this conversation between the two of you and Monica. Thank you for sharing your beautiful poetry. Um, Andrew, I appreciate you doing the interview. It was thoughtful on your part and very thought provoking too. I, that's one of the, the gifts we had running this residency is to hear these type of exchanges and it just brings so much new thought for us. And that's just a wonderful thing to, to be a part of. So thank you so much. Um, just uh, before we go, let you know that we, anybody that's stuck along this far for the interview, I hope you have, because it was just phenomenal. But uh, we do have an open call right now for writers and song songwriters and composers that goes through February 17th. So please see our website if anybody listening is interested in that, would like more information. We're lucky to have Monica here. She was chosen out of 40 candidates for these residencies. So we, we get highly qualified, just wonderful um, residents that come to Goodheart. Um, the other thing is just thank you, everyone that helps us sponsor, or sponsors this program, help us support this program, and specifically for the support of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network. So thank you, everybody.